today. Um, and I'm just going like, to uh, tell you about some highlights and things that I've noticed in the past 20 years that I've been researching elephants. I've been very fortunate that I've had, um, I dealt with elephants in various conditions, right from captivity right through to free roaming, wild, very wild elephants. And um, so I'm just going to chat to you a little bit about what I've noticed, differences between the captive and the wild elephants, and how I see elephant welfare. Okay, so just to start off, um, why should we even care, you know, why, why care about elephants? And I mean, there's many, many things that makes them very unique, and I'm not going to go into detail onto that. Um, a, a lot of the speaker, other speakers already mentioned some of them. Um, but I think one of the things is, is, a, is an element of compassion and empathy um, that we see among them and that I think we're busy losing in humanity and, and um, that we can learn a lot from, from elephants in that respect. Um, so the other thing of concern, sorry, that's, uh, it's not connected, I must just <laughs> remember. <laughs> so the other thing of concern is that um, if we look at South Africa as a whole and we look at the conservation of the species, um, elephant as a species, um, it's frightening to see what is available in our country for elephant. I mean, so that's a study that we did, a survey across South Africa. It's wild elephant, not captive. Captives are not included here. Um, and it's incredible that it's only there at the Greater Kruger that there seems to be a little bit of significant space. But it's, it's these fragmented populations occurring everywhere. And even though the population in South Africa as a whole is, seems to be growing, it, uh, um, elephants as a whole is they're busy decreasing if you look across Africa. And um, the frightening thing is 78% of our elephants in South Africa is in the Greater Kruger. And then 60% of the other populations um, have less than 30 animals per, per uh, population in, in these small fragmented reserves. Okay. And um, that raises issues of elephant welfare. And um, so the way I see it is that, that it's, it's along a, gra a gradient. Elephant welfare ca can be ma measured along a gradient. Sorry, I'm again forgetting about this one. <laughs> elephant um, can be, uh, wealthy can be measured along a gradient from excellent to poor. And if we look at the factors that, that, that I've now noticed in, in, in my career that is really impacting on, on, on whether an elephant is under poor or excellent welfare conditions, the first that comes to mind is the frequency and the level of exposure to human activity. Um, and so elephants in different situations are exposed to people and human activity and noises around lodges, tourists um, wanting to view elephants in a zoo, you know, it can get really uh, quite loud. So um, with this particular factor, there is also an aspect of habituation. Um, so it's not necessarily all, all that bad always. Elephants do get habituated to an extent to human activity. But then we go to you know, when things go wrong, the consequences of, of, of people harassing elephants constantly is that it sometimes leads to aggression. And, and we, we all know that there are these cases where elephants attack vehicles or people, and it's because they just push too far. Um, sorry, that was again. <laughs> Um, so it leads to aggression, and, and, and that, that's what are the consequences of one of those things. Then we look at um, the second factor that's actually even more important, and that is um, the intensity and frequency, uh, the intensity, freq frequency, and artificial nature of human intervention. So it's not just the fact that people are viewing elephants. It's also the fact that people are directly impacting on elephants because we control them in so many ways. So, and that, again, ranges from, from um, elephant fencing that's put up um, or, or fences around lodges to keep elephants out. People shoot them with, with chili balls to keep them away from, from um, lodges. We collar elephants. That's a traumatic event every time that happens. Um, people, uh, elephants in captivity are trained sometimes in very cruel ways. We capture orphans from the wild. Um, we translocate elephants. I mean, uh, that upside down elephant is not maybe, you know, it, we, we see it as good, but, you know, it, it's all trauma that we, we're busy... Um, exposing these animals to, and then there's also the effect of poaching, killing, culling, all of that is, is how we impact on elephants, and that will affect the, their welfare. Okay, and the consequences of that, the most extreme case that I've witnessed myself and that I was involved in, and probably the saddest thing of my career was this elephant um, I studied for 18 years, and he was killed by another elephant. 
But if you look at the history of what's, what went on, in that, on that reserve, it is horrible what they were exposed to. And eventually they started killing each other. So um, there are horrible consequences to these things. The next important factor that we can look at is um, the completeness of the social structure. So we do realize that elephants you know, live in very close-knit societies. It ranges from, from the core of the mother and the calf, very close bonds, the family, their, their, their sisters and aunts and everybody. And then when these families get bigger, they split into bond groups, but these bond groups like, keep on associating with each other. And um, so it's a very complex society. And even with the bulls, there are hierarchies at larger scales, and the bulls know exactly where they fit in. And the older ones you know, teach the younger ones. And the consequences of not, that not being there is what we've often seen on some of the, uh, uh, in the past and some of the reserves in South Africa um, where there weren't like proper bull hierarchies and these orphan elephants were introduced into these reserves. They started, you know, uh, just misbehaving and started killing rhinos. And it's because they, there were no older bulls to suppress the release of testosterone. They went into these premature mast cycles and it really... Um, led to a lot of uh, problems. Um, and only after introduction of all the bulls where, you know, did, did this behavior seem to um, calm down. Okay, then the other thing that's uh, quite important is space. Okay, so we, we've heard some, with some of the other speakers, our elephants need a lot of space. And linked to that often is um, environmental enrichment, but it, which is not always the case, but Generally, the more space you have, you know, the less you have to provide in, in environmental enrichment. Um, and, but that's, um, so uh, environmental enrichment, when it's very high, you know, your, your welfare tends to be uh, better. When you've got a lot of space, welfare issues is not so much of a problem. Also connected to this is the, um, the uh, dependency of the elephants on, on food of humans. So that's also very, very closely linked to to available space. So the more space you have, the, the less dependent an elephant is on a human for getting food and water. But the, the more you can find them, I mean, even some of these small game reserves, they have to feed the illies in the, in the dry season because they, they, uh, else they, they really um, hammer the vegetation. So um, they become more and more dependent on people for, you, for their water and food requirements. Now the consequences of small spaces and a very little in environmental enrichment is what some of my colleagues have also mentioned now, is the stereotypic behavior that they then display. When, they, when they're really in these small confined areas and there's no, no, not a lot of stimulus and, and everything, they start developing very interesting behaviors like head bobbing, where they just stand and do this all the time, or they start rocking, constantly rocking. It's, it's like somebody in an asylum, okay, that you know, you, eventually they just get to a point where they yeah, <laughs> do funny things. So if we put all of this together, sorry, I, um, if we put all of this together, um, and we see the ideal situation is that we have all our elephants having, you know, a low frequency or expo level of exposure, low intensity uh, or frequency of um, interference. We've got complete social structures. Um, we've got environmental enrichment. Um, you know, because they're living in the wild and they're in wild open spaces. Okay, that's the ideal. But the reality of the matter is wherever I've gone working with elephants, this is not reality anymore. There's almost no populations like this left on earth. Okay, so all of them are impacted to some extent. And it's also not an aspect of just looking at you know, a zoo, a small space, you know, it's an unhappy elephant. You can have a relatively small sanctuary or area with sufficient um, environmental enrichment, or not sufficient, but relatively um, uh, 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 environmental enrichment. You've got um, at least some social structure going, maybe a little familyhood. Um, the people are, you know, careful with how they manage the elephants and how they expose them to people. Um, compared to an, a, a game reserve, which might have more space, but where the elephants, when there's not a proper uh, social structure, sorry, oh, sorry, let me just, this thing keeps confusing me. So that's the example in yellow of, of um, elephants in a small available space, and they can have um, some of the other components of what they require. But then you get a case of an elephant that's got large, more space, but they don't have any social structure. They're constantly being harassed with collaring, with tourists um, harassing them. They came from culls as orphans. They don't have social structure. All of that. And it might eventually lead to the fact that the elephants in a smaller space might even be 
better off than the ones in a bigger space, okay? And so it's all relative, and we have to, to look at all these aspects together. Uh, all right. Then, just to quickly highlight the behavioral differences. How am I for time? Okay. The, the behavioral differences between captive and wild elephants that I noticed, and these are just things that stood out for me. And one of the things is... Um, is that wild elephants seem to be more sort of aware, alert, um, sensitive, in a, in a, if, if that's the right word to describe. Um, so they move quicker, they respond quicker to stimulus. And when you look at these captive ellies, um, at the bottom, for example, that the, above is wild, at, at the bottom is captive, you see that these captive elephants, they often have these sort of drooped faces, very listless, don't move around a lot, don't really react to anything happening around them. And, and that stands, really stands out if, you, if you've worked with bo on both sides. You, you really, it, it, this, this difference is quite marked. Um, then, um, wild elephants have typical ways in which they respond to a disturbance. And it ranges from an initial assessment where they would like, okay, there's something funny, let's smell, lift the trunk, raise the, the head, no, spread the ears. And, and it can go right down to um, where they eventually do, does, uh, they display how, what they're going to do with the, when they get you. So bend down, tusking the ground when they're really stressed, or they flee, or they charge. Okay, so, so these are all things that wild elephants typically do. But what I've also seen now with captive ellies is that they kind of behave out of context sometimes. So they will display some of these behaviors but in a total different context. And so it's almost like there's a level of confusion that they haven't really been taught properly on, on, on how to behave correctly. And there's even been some interesting scientific studies done on this um, where um, one group compared elephants coming from calls as orphans that didn't have a proper social structure, who was exp exposed to a lot of trauma, um, and compared the way that they behaved to playbacks from um, elephants um, that they know and elephants that they don't know. And they compared this with wild elephants in Ambuseli. And the interesting thing is that in Amb Ambuseli, the elephants did what you, expected is when you, uh, what you expect them to do. So if you play an, a familiar elephant voice to them, you know, they were kind of curious and, you know, who is this or what is, where is this elephant? But when you play an unfamiliar elephant voice to, to the wild elephants, they bunch together. It's a defensive reaction. Like, who is this? What's going on? Why, what is this elephant doing here? Whereas the Pilansberg elephants weren't very consequent in the, in the way that they responded to, to different playback experiments. So, so um, they would bunch together if it's a familiar elephant and, and you know, not when, when it's an unfamiliar elephant. So it, this, this also indicates that they, they, they don't behave the same as, as captive elephants, oh, 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 free-ranging free wild ele elephants. Um, Vocalisation seemed to play a role. <laughs> okay, I'm almost, almost done. Um, so a study that I did... Uh, on, on elephant vocalizations, I could see that uh, with lots of tourist pressure, elephants tend to growl and roar more, and the, the calf moan, moans more, and that's because the mother gets uncomfortable and she doesn't want the calf to drink, so the calves complain more. Um, but there's also a very big learning component with communication skills. And some studies have shown that you know, elephants can actually start imitating trucks and, and uh, uh, human speech and all of that. And, Basically, when I started working or being exposed to more to captive elephants, I've also noticed that they speak a little bit of a different language. Okay, so, <laughs> so um, yeah, those are just the studies that was done. Um, temporal gland secretions uh, is also an interesting thing. It's like elephant tears. Between the eye and the ear, there's gland that secretes, and it's not just males when they are in mast, females also secrete, but it's very much linked to emotion, emotions of elephants. And um, it's basically some females secrete easier than others, like some women cry easier than others, and some, um, on a bad day, they would secrete much more than on, on other days. And it's basically very much related to um, the stimulus and I just came up with a sort of hypothetical model that we're actually busy testing with one of our studies with the Elephant Reintegration Trust. And that is that along with, uh, as, temporal gland, uh, as the stimulus increases, the temporal gland secretion would increase. Um, but with captive elephants, you find that they don't really, the temporal gland secretion doesn't increase with, with the stimulus um, being, uh, in increasing. It seems almost like that mechanism switches off and it takes a lot more before they secrete. And um, 
I think it goes so far that in, in very horrible conditions where they are really traumatized constantly, the mechanism switches off and it's like a robot, they don't secrete anymore. Um, and yeah, that's just some interesting thing. I'm almost done. <laughs> um, just with the changes in behavior of elephants, there's just two points that I want to highlight. We did a study where we reintegrated some elephants from, captiv uh, from captivity, from elephant back safaris, back into the wild. And the thing that has stood out for me and that I'll never forget is that, is that they, um, once they released, they didn't go back to the BOMAs. The BOMAs in the stables where they stayed for 20 years long, they did not return. So um, that shows that they don't want to be there. Okay? And, and the last one is... Um, the stereotype behaviors, stereotypic behaviors that I measured while they were still in captivity, there were some of the females that were rocking and, and showing these type of behaviors, that all disappeared once they were back into the wild. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> mm.